you, Pastor Ted, and it's great to be back to you, be with you on this Sunday morning. Thank you so much for the warm. <laughs> it is chilly, isn't it? My goodness. James Dobson, a familiar name to you? Well, James Dobson is one of the prominent Christian psychologists in America today. He's the founder of uh, Focus on the Family. Uh, for many years, he was the executive director of Focus on the Family. And that's why I was particularly interested recently when I read a question that was uh, posed to him in an interview that he was having. And the person turned to him and said something like this. He said, Dr. Dobson, if you had one sentence of advice to give to parents, what would it be? Now that caught my attention because I'm a parent. It caught my attention because I'm a grandparent, four children and 13 grandchildren. My goodness. Now that's not going to catch your attention because most of you aren't parents. But some of you are, and many of you are wannabe parents. Someday that's down the road. You haven't thought too much about that because you're in exams right now, but you want to be parents. It's part of God's plan. So think of the question. If you had a one sentence piece of advice for parents, what would it be? Well, that's pretty significant and pretty important because parenting is part of our stewardship. And if you've been with me during this year, on my visits, that's what I've been talking about. Our series has been entitled, Becoming a Good Steward. I hope you've learned a lot about becoming a good steward. Some of the things we've learned, just by way of review, go like this. We've learned that a steward in the culture of the first century was somebody who was entrusted with the management of somebody else's businesses, somebody else's issues, somebody else's affairs. Uh, you could be the steward of a person's farm. You could be the steward of a person's business. You could be a steward of the family's, uh, the person's children. Uh, but uh, that's what a steward was. They were entrusted with the management. They were managers of somebody else's who had ownership. Uh, stewards understood that there were four very fundamental principles in stewardship. The first is the principle of ownership. Stewards didn't own a thing. Everything they had was owned by somebody else. And that's important for me to understand in my stewardship as a Christian that I don't own a thing. Everything I have has been given to me and uh, God is the owner of it all. It's a principle of ownership. And then there's the principle of responsibility. Uh, when the owner entrusts something to me, then I have some responsibility with what's been entrusted to me. And that's important for me to understand in my Christian life. I have some responsibilities with what God has entrusted to me. And then the third great principle is accountability. Because God has entrusted these things to me to manage them for him, someday I'm going to give an account of my stewardship. And that's a pretty solemn fact. I'm going to stand before the Lord, and the Lord has entrusted me with this, and entrusted me with that, and entrusted me, and I'm going to give an account of how I managed what he's entrusted to me. That's the third principle. And the fourth principle of stewardship is the principle of reward. When we have done what the master wanted us to do with what the master entrusted to us, then we're going to have his acclamation his affirmation, his commendation. And uh, it's all wrapped up in that little phrase, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And with that comes rewards, rewards that are eternal rewards. Well, those are the four great principles of stewardship. And I hope that you've got a hold of those principles and understood them because you're a steward if you're a Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a steward. And uh, we've learned that God has entrusted a variety of things to us. The first thing we found out was that God entrusted a mind to us. And then we found out that God entrusted these bodies to us. And then we found out that God entrusts time to us. 
and he entrusts money to us. And then we found out that he entrusts spiritual gifts to us. And that he entrusts to us the message of the gospel. Now those are the six, the six that we've studied this year. You could have told me those back, couldn't you? You got those all together? Well, they're not hard to remember. Mind and body go together. Time and money go together. And gifts and gospel go together. That's my little way of remembering them. Have you got those six? Well, this morning we're going to add the seventh, and then in our Bible class we're going to add the eighth, and that will conclude our series. In our Bible class we're going to talk about leadership. And God gives us all leadership responsibilities. We all get involved in the course of our life with responsible leadership. And uh, we're going to talk about leadership in our class, uh, in our Bible class, and I hope that you'll be able to be there for that. But let's come back to the seventh now in our list, and that's parenting. Parenting is a stewardship. The children I have have been entrusted to me by God. He's the owner. He has prior claim to them. He has just put them into my trust for a period of time. And I have a responsibility. And uh, that responsibility is very clear. It says in the scriptures that it's required of stewards that a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad or a teenager or a family member, it's required of stewards that stewards be, what's the word? One word. Come on, say it all together. The one word is? I'm going to tell you, so you'll say it with me now, will it? The one word, what's the one requirement of stewards? It's that they be faithful. Come on, now all together. It's that they be faithful. That's not bad, but you can do twice that good. Come on. It's that they be faithful. Now, what's it mean to be faithful? Well, here it is. Fasten your seatbelt. A person who's a faithful steward discerns what the owner wants done with what's been entrusted to him, and he does it. That's all. That's, that's simply it. A faithful steward, first of all, needs to understand what the owner wants done. He gets a whole lot of insight there. And when he gets a whole lot of insight as to what he wants done with his time, what he wants done with his money, what he wants to done with his spiritual gift, when he knows what God wants done with it, and he does it, that's a faithful steward. So here we come to parenting this morning. If I'm going to be a faithful steward of my parenting, and many of us here are parents this morning, and so I'm speaking directly to you, but many of us here are parents-to-be, and it's a whole lot easier to speak to you when you're parents-to-be than when you've been parents 10 or 15 years and try to change the pattern and habits. So I'm not apologizing this morning that I'm about a year or three or four years ahead of you, because I want to give you a head start on your parenting, so that you'll enter into your parenting understanding what a faithful steward or a faithful parent is. All right, so don't get, don't get all nervous about this thing about parenting that's, that's rushing fast at you, because I know it's down the road for many of you, but I want you to go into it understanding what a faithful steward is, because many of us, when we went into it, didn't understand it. And we learned it after we were parents for five years or ten years or fifteen years and said, oh, if I'd only known that, if I'd only known that, why didn't we do that? Well, I want, you, I want to save you from, from that nightmare. And uh, if you talk to your parents about it, your parents will express, if I'd only known that, if I'd only understood that when I, got, I was so young and I didn't know that, nobody had taught me that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you from that this morning now, and I'm going to prepare you for parenting down the road. Many of us who are already there, I'm going to encourage you in your parenting, and that's what I'd like to do. So let's come back to James Dobson's one-sentence advice. If you had one sentence of advice for parents, what would it be? Now just think, here's, the, here's, here's probably the number one spokesperson in America speaking on the subject of parenting. What would your one sentence of advice be? Here it is now. He said, 
my piece of advice would be this. Drench your mind in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. Well, that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Drench your mind. That means immerse your mind, soak your mind in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, because that's what we're going to do for the next 20 or 25 minutes. We're going to soak our minds in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. If you look at it, uh, Dr. Dobson suggests that in these verses there are three principles and I want to talk to you about these three principles very simply this morning and try to help pre prepare you for parenting or try to help you in your parenting wherever you are in that journey today. The first principle, let me read the verses first of all. These are probably among the verses of the Old Testament, these are probably among the most critically, the most significant verses in all of the Old Testament for an Israelite. Because they begin with these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, if you were becoming a proselyte from Gentile heathen paganism into Judaism, you would go through a little ceremony. And that would be the sentence that you would proclaim. That was called in the, the Israel nation of Israel, their confession of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, what on earth are those verses all about? Well, let's sort of break it down and put it together so that we can take it home with us in a package. The first principle that's involved here is what we will call the principle of incarnation. Now, when we talk about the incarnation, what we talk about, God becoming man. The incarnation was that God was wrapped in flesh. That's incarnation. He was wrapped in humanity. And when I'm talking about the principle of incarnation, I'm saying that what we need to learn to do is to take the truth of God and our knowledge of God and our relationship with God, and we need to wrap that in our hearts and in our minds. Let me show you how that develops. Verse 4 begins with this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now that's not talking specifically about monotheism, one God against all the pagan gods. Uh, it's not talking about there's one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one God. What that is talking about is the exclusiveness of God. And if you want to get that line and put it together it's in a way that's going to grab your heart and grab your ears, this is what it's saying. It's saying Yahweh, and that's the name for Israel's personal name for God. Yahweh is our God, God alone, Yahweh alone. It's speaking of the exclusiveness of God. They lived in a culture where there are all kinds of gods being worshipped. And the confession of faith is, Yahweh is our God, God alone. He's alone our God. Now what it's talking about, I think, in our culture today is this. We live in a world that is surrounding us with, with idolatry. Not the same kind of idolatry that they had in the days of Israel, their gods were gods of stone and trees and material kind of kinds of things. Uh, our gods are immaterial kinds of things and uh, ideologies and materialistic kinds of things. Uh, 
how would you identify a god? What, what would your definition of idolatry be? I was driving with my wife in the car yesterday, and I asked her that question. What would you, what would you identify as idolatry? What, what's God to our world today? And I loved her answer to me. She said, uh, well, an idol is anything that takes the place of God in our life. Now, that's a pretty good answer. Anything that takes the place of God in my life is an idol. And what, uh, what Moses is saying, God is saying through Moses, is this. Now, what you need to do is to recognize that Yahweh is our God. Yahweh alone. He's talking about the exclusiveness of God in the midst of all kind of idolatry. And notice who he's talking to. He's talking to parents. He's talking to parents, and he said, now listen, before I talk to you about your parenting, let me talk to you about being a parent. And the first thing that you need to learn to do is to recognize that don't let anybody, anything, crowd out the rulership of God, the dominion of God, the control of God, the authority of God in your life. Yahweh is our God. Yahweh alone. The exclusiveness of God. Above all other kinds of persons and things and demands, God is God. And God, that God is our Lord. Now, how is that expressed? Well, the next verse says so. It says how. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, you perhaps know from the New Testament that Jesus identified this as the first and greatest commandment. He does that when a lawyer comes to him and says, uh, Teacher, we know that you're a great teacher of the law. Judaism had formulated all the laws to total about 613, and all the sharp, sharp lawyers argued, you know, the order of priority. And so this lawyer comes along and says, would you, would, would you settle the debate that's taking place in all of our classes? Uh, what's number one of those 613? And the Lord, without a moment's hesitation, says, this is it. Here it is. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's the first, and it's the greatest commandment. Before you become a parent... You need to be a parent. And to be a parent involves putting him as exclusively your God. Authority, rulership, worship, obedience. He is God. And then you're to love that God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Boy, that's quite, a, that's quite an enormous challenge, isn't it? The first step to loving God is to know God. And the way you come to know God is through Jesus. If you're going to be a parent who's a faithful steward of those children that God is going to give you or that God has given you, you need to go know God. And the way you come to know God is through Jesus. When you open your heart and life to Jesus, when you receive him into your life, when you trust him as your savior, when you accept him as the one who's paid the penalty for your sin, and you put your faith and trust in him for your forgiveness and salvation, an amazing thing happens. You're brought into a family with God. You're brought into an intimate personal relationship with God. You come to know God personally as a child of God to a heavenly father. That's a wonderful relationship to have. Do you know him? Do you, do you know God this morning? Well, you can. And the way you come to know him is through his son, Jesus. Now, if you know him, parenting begins with loving God. Loving God. Do you love God? I, I, I know that you know him. Do you love God? Well, I have written a book on preparing for marriage. 
And uh, one of my lessons on preparing for marriage is tests of love. So if you're not sure whether you love this young lady or this young man, then you need to buy my book on preparing for marriage and look up that test. And I've got ten questions in that book on uh, how to test whether you're really in love or not. How do you know that you love God? What are the tests about loving God? Well, I don't know, but I've got something to suggest to you. People who love God tell God that they love him. Are you comfortable doing that? When was the last time that you told him that you love him? See, people who are in love do that. People who are in love spend time with people that they love. They don't ignore them. They don't avoid them. They spend time. That's one of the indications of a serious relationship. Just, just spend time with God? Uh, people who love God are serious about eliminating things from their lives that are going to offend God. Oh, my goodness. Do you, do you love God? Are the things that your life, that, that you know, are an offense to God? Well, people who love God, they want to eliminate those things that offend the God they love. And my fourth test is people who love God bring into their life things that they know they're going to please God. Now, those are four very simple tests you just put yourself. Do you love God? See, this principle of incarnation involves taking this God who's here and um, coming to know him. And... Uh, Recognizing that his, his rulership and dominance is, is number one in my life. And then building a relationship with him where, where, where they love him. And then on the basis of that relationship, notice what the next verse says. Verse 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And he's referring now to all that he's saying in the book of Deuteronomy. These are, these are the words of God. And these words shall be in your heart. So what he's saying to us, I think, in those verses is this. That parenting begins with me. It doesn't begin with my kids. Parenting begins with me. I need, I need to be a parent. And here are the characteristics of a Christian parent, of a godly parent. A Christian and godly parent. They acknowledge God as their exclusive ruler and leader and Lord. They build a relationship with him, a love relationship with him. That's their heart. And then in that love relationship with him, the things that he says, the things that he teaches, the word of God is taken to heart so that they do what he has asked them to do and they be what God has asked them to be. Do you love God? Do you love God? That's what godly parents aspire for. Parenting begins with me, and it makes all the difference in the world. I want to suggest to you that one of the greatest legacies that you can ever leave to your children is the legacy of a life that was lived in the love of God. Is that how your parent, how your children look at you? Is, is that the message that you communicate with them? David was a young man who was dying of cancer. One day his father and his uncle came to the hospital to visit him. And after a short time, he asked his uncle if he would leave so that he could have a visit with his dad. And his uncle left and David and his dad had a visit. After a few minutes, David's dad stepped out of the room and met the uncle who was standing in the hall and suggested that they go down to the coffee shop and have a coffee together. They went down and sat down at the table, and David's dad turned to his brother and said, uh, I want to tell you what happened in that room just a few minutes ago. He said, uh, David asked me to come over close to the bed. 
And then he asked if he could put his arms around me. And he says, I stooped over, and David reached his frail little arms up, and he put his arms around me. And then he said, uh, David uh, asked me to put my arms around him. And so he said, I reached down and I put my arms around him. And then he said, David whispered in my ears, and this is what he said, Dad, I just want you to know that the greatest gift God ever gave me out of my salvation was the gift of a father and a mother who loved God and taught me to love him too. Is there any legacy more, more powerful, any legacy more rich than that? See, the point of our text is this. The parenting begins with me, the kind of person I am, the kind of person that I need to be. And that kind of person is the kind of person who exclusively acknowledges God as God in their life. And they love that God. And the things that that God has said they has taken to heart. And they're living that out in their life. Now that's the first principle uh, of, um, of, of family matters as uh, laid out here by Moses. Now there's a second principle. And look at the next verse. Look at what the next verse says. Verse 7. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them as you go through these various things. Did you notice those two words? You shall teach them, and you shall talk of them. This is the principle, of course, of instruction. Now, isn't it very significant, parents, that before I'm told to instruct my children and how I'm to instruct them, I'm told to get things straightened in my life first. So verses 4, 5, and 6 deal with me. Now verse 7 comes on and says, now this is what you're to do with your children. Don't jump to verse 7 and get just, until you've dealt with verses 4, 5, and 6. And you young people right now, you're in the process of verses 4, 5, and 6. Cultivating and developing that kind of relationship with God that will make you a parent. That will enable you to be the kind of parent that you want to be and you should be. And not wake up 20 years or 40 years down the road and say, I wish I had known that. I wish I had done that. Now is the time to be that person who can be the kind of parent that God wants you to do. Parenting doesn't begin with instructing your kids. Parenting begins with getting yourself straightened out, getting yourself organized, getting yourself being the kind of person that God wants you to be. And you're in that process right now. That's what's happening right now in your life. Loving God taking his word and putting it into your heart, being the kind of person who can be a parent. Now, when God entrusts the children to you, what do you do? Well, you've got a couple of responsibilities here, it says. The first one is to teach them. Love that. To teach your children diligently. That means to be rigorous about your teaching. I think the emphasis in that line is the formal instruction. There needs to be some formal instruction of your children in the truths of God and the word of God. Now that's incredibly important today. It's an imperative today for at least three reasons. Number one, it's because of the indoctrination that your children face every day of the week, all week long, all day long out in that culture and in that world. They're indoctrinated with secularism, and with liberalism, and with humanism, and relativism, and rationalism, and evolutionism, and sexism, and a dozen other isms. Your children are confronting those kind of isms every day of their life. And what they need to counter all of that is a mom and a dad who will teach them diligently, rigorously, formally, in an organized way, they will teach them the word of God. It's because of the indoctrination of the world. Secondly, it's because of the um, inadequacy of your church. Because I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, that's what our church is for. That's what the youth program at the church is for. That's what Sunday school is for. 
That dude's a che- no, 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 no. Your children will spend about 1% of their time at church, 16 to 20% of their time at school, 80% of their time at home. It's at home where they need the teaching. Sunday school can't do it. Now, we thank God for the Sunday school teachers. Thank God for Pastor Ted, the preaching that comes from the pulpit. But church, won't, church isn't enough. It begins at home. And the responsibility of the parent is to rigorously, organized, logically, systematically, to instruct their children in the truths of God's word, to teach them the word of God. And the third reason why that's really important is because of the influence of home. And um, lots of evidence to support that. Columbia University did a study a while ago that demonstrated that the, uh, the influences in the character development of their children, 16% comes from character-forming organizations like church and Boy Scouts and Awana and so on. 33% comes from their peer group. 51% comes from family at home. That's the influence of the home. And do you know what they concluded from that study? Columbia University, not Tyndale Theological Seminary. Columbia University, the number one factor in influencing the character development of the children was father's conversation at the supper table. See, that's the influence of home. And so Moses is saying, God is saying through him, parents, teach your children. Formally, rigorously, systematically, teach them and instruct them the word of God. And so I hope when you set up your home, that will be one of the things that you will determine to do. That you will have a systematic, organized, rigorous schedule of teaching your children. Don't leave it to the pastor. Don't leave it to the youth pastor. Don't leave it to the Sunday school teacher. They'll, They'll support you. And they'll, give compl- they'll, they'll compliment what you do, but they can't do it. They can't do it without a parent at home and without a family at home that is teaching their children the word of God. I hope that you'll be that kind of parent. And if you're just learning that that's your responsibility as a steward of those children, then you need to understand that this morning, that your responsibility is to teach them the word of God, to instruct them in the word of God. And I hope that you will have wonderful books available at Christian bookstores. And uh, your pastoral team here can give you advice on that. There's lots of material that's available to you, but that's your responsibility. And I'll go one step further and really point the finger and say it's primarily dad's responsibility, not mom's. Proof? Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, it says. Fathers. Bring up your children. Teach them. Responsibility of fathers. Primary responsibility. Now, I know that we excuse ourselves and explain it away. All You can't avoid the scriptures. The responsibility of the father. Primary responsibility is to informally teach the scriptures to their children. I hope that you will raise your children teaching them the word of God. When we were raising our children, we had a family night on, Wednesday, on Thursday night. And uh, I was booked Thursday night. Uh, if you phoned me for this or for that, I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm booked up for that night. And Thursday night was family night. And we did all kinds of wonderful things together as a family. We would cook our hot dogs in the fireplace and play some games and um, watch a television program. We do all kinds of things. It was family night. But one of the things we did was we had a Bible study. And I took them through various studies and I taught the children the word of God. And uh, that's not because I'm a teacher. That's because I'm a dad. And that's because that's what Christian dads do. They teach their children the word of God. And they do it in a formal kind of way. Marilyn was involved in it. She was backing me up, and sometimes she would be taking part in it. But that was primarily my responsibility to teach them the word of God. Now, interestingly, in that instruction, there's another word that's used. And it says, and you shall talk to them in the way. Now, I think that talking to them is the informal instruction. 
So it doesn't always have to be formal structure, sit down, okay, now here's our time to study together tonight or Sunday afternoon or whatever. Uh, that's, that's the formal, and you need to have that. This is the book that we're studying. These are, the, these are the notes that we're studying, that you need to have that in your home where you're formally teaching and instructing them in the Word of God. But you also need to talk to them, and you talk to them casually and informally. And uh, my experience, and certainly Marilyn would agree with me, by far more effective than our formal teaching was our informal talking about it. So we'd be watching a television program together and something had come on and, boy, that was an opportunity to talk to kids about honesty, to talk to them about being truthful, to talk to them about integrity, to talk to them about moral purity, to talk to them about respecting authority. And you can do that watching a television program. When the commercial comes on, don't pay any attention to the commercial. Just forget about the commercial. Say, did you see what happened in that last scene? Do you see what's going on here? And what you're doing is you're talking to them. And then that talking helps them to understand and see in real life situations the principles and truths that you want to communicate over to them. Talk to them as you're, uh, as you're going through the situations of life. One day our, one of our daughters came home from school and told Marilyn that so-and-so had dropped out of school. Why? Well, she's pregnant. Now what's mom do in a situation like that? That was the, that was the moment for Marilyn to sit down with our daughter at the kitchen table and to talk to her about sexual purity, about immorality, about premarital sex, right in the context of her girlfriend having to drop out of school because she was pregnant. That's the picture of the text. So the principle of instruction is the second one. And then there's a third principle that I'll mention just quickly, and the third principle is this. Let's read it together. You shall talk with them when they are sitting in the house, when they're walking in the way, when they lay down, when they rise up. Now, if you look at those in uh, the way they're set against each other, it simply says this. Um, when they're sitting down and when they're getting up. Well, that means uh, all the time and when they're out in the way or when they're at home, any place. I think it's Anytime, anywhere, you're going to have opportunities to talk to your kids. You're driving down the road and you listen to a song come on the radio and, boy, you listen to the words of that song and say, hey, do you, do you, did you hear, what that, do you hear what he was just singing? And that's an opportunity for you to just turn it down and to say something about being honest and being truthful and being a person of uh, integrity or whatever it is you want to emphasize. So the emphasizes, emphasis is, is just being constantly looking for opportunities to have input, to instruct them in ways to live their lives in a godly way. That's parenting. It begins with the parent, and then it flows over with teaching and instructing them. And then finally, it ends up with getting them involved. And this is what it says in verses 8 and 9. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. You'll write them on the doorposts of the house and on your gates. Now, are you going to do that literally? Well, no, no, no. That's not what you do literally. This is metaphorical language. And there is a metaphor here. And the metaphor is simply this. You shall bind them on your hand and bind them on your forehead. And what that's saying is, what you want to do is to work with your children so that they are, they are practicing, that they're, in, they're, they're involved, they're, they're putting to practice in what they do, in how they think, what you've been studying in the Word of God. You get them involved in their actions and in their thinking in harmony with what you've been teaching them. The first principle is incarnation. The second principle is instruction. The third principle is involvement. You involve them in applying it and working out into their life. And you, you encourage them how they can work out what we learned in that study last night or how we can work out that verse that we've done. And it, it's worked out in the, the actions of their life and in the thinking of their life, okay? So it's in their actions and thinking. That's the first combination. And then the second one is, it says, you shall put it on the doorpost of your house and over the door. And what it's saying is, when you're at home, when you're in the family, the way we live together in our home, we apply what we've been learning. 
We, we apply the biblical principles. We, we apply the scriptures. We live them out in our marriage. We live them out in our family relationship between mom and dad and, and daughter and son. And we do that at home. And then when we leave home and when we go out to school, when we go out to the office, when we go out to play a game, we apply them out there too. So we're applying what we've been learning and studying. We apply it in our actions. We apply it in our thinking. We apply it when we're at home. We apply it when we're going out in the way. And that's a parent's responsibility, to help their children to learn how to apply and to work out in their life what they've been learning and studying. Now, that's Christian parenting. It involves the principle of uh, incarnation and then instruction and then involvement in life. Those are the three great principles. And I want to commend those principles to you. I want to pray, I'm praying that God will, God will put those into your heart, and you'll see now, you'll see now what Dobson is saying when he's saying, drench yourself in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Memorize those verses. Meditate on those verses. Study those verses. Get to understand what those verses are. That's the heart of a Christian family. That's the heart of a godly home. That's the heart of being a faithful steward of the family. Family matters. And this is how it matters. So, Lord, that's my prayer for this wonderful class group this morning. For those of us who are parents, we have some shaping up to do. We have some adjusting to do. Some of us are, are late in starting. We should have been doing this 20 years ago, but it's not too late. And I pray that this will be a real turning point for many of the parents in the church, that they will really seriously uh, take to heart becoming the kind of parent that they need to be, and then instructing and involving their children in living out what they're studying and learning. And then for those wannabe parents, these wonderful young people with such great hearts, Lord, I pray that right now they'll begin the preparation for that, that phase of stewardship that's down the road for them, and they'll become part of, uh, of a team that establishes a godly Christian spiritual home. So bless your word. Just make it fruitful in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.